Seeing what happened to the first speaker, I'm very happy to be here in person so we can uh, talk to each other. Uh, as Igor said, my name is Roger Selye. I come from a research group that works with uh, uh, studying the digitization of Swedish society, not just education or preschool education, but also other sectors like healthcare and the workplace and so on. But this talk will be about digital childhood and sociocognitive development. And I'm also a, a, have a long interest in the Vygotskian, the Russian uh, psychological development, psychological tradition. And it's also great to be here, not just because I can speak in person, but I meet the friends that I used to meet as this uh, conference uh, for a number of years now. Um, so, uh, I will, I will start at a different level than Sasha did, but uh, uh, the purpose of education, any kind of education, is to contribute to the reproduction of knowledge and skills and identities of individuals and groups relevant for society. And it's also the duty of education to, do, to stimulate and develop the talents of children and of adults, I would say, nowadays, because adults are at school as well, and to prepare them for life as active citizens. This is the overarching goal of education, goals of education, and this is why uh, your government pays you to do what you do. Um, in traditional societies, and now I'm being very quick, uh, this often meant that we reproduced a rather limited and very stable uh, type of knowledge, or stock of knowledge, as it said here. Uh, the experiences and knowledge of the parents, of the parent generation, were sufficient and uh, relevant for the new generation. So society was uh, not changing that, mu that much. These were also societies where there was a limited di division of labor, as sociologists say. There were not many professions, not many activities, and there was transparent uh, institutional structures like the church and the military and, uh, and so on. Uh, if we, uh, if we take the uh, Vygotskian framework into this uh, development of societies, uh, we, and this is, will be my point, that the world is changing. We are no longer in the situation I just described. But um, the point here is that children grow up in social environments where they appropriate or internalize uh, uh, the ideas and modes of social interaction uh, that that uh, characterize their society, and de they develop a skill of how to use the cultural tools, both physical tools and intellectual tools. And as I said, in, in a traditional society, this was fairly transparent. The tools were the same from generation to generation. Um, in times of dynamically cha changing societies and societies that are uh, undergoing rapid transformation, the situation is very different. The skills and experiences of the parent generations are only partially available for the new generation. Uh, and here are some of the factors uh, that are affecting this, uh, the reshaped societies today. It's globalization, uh, it's digitalization, it's a dramatic knowledge explosion. We have never had so many researchers in the world as we have now, and there's a steady production of uh, knowledge. We have increasingly complex social institutions. The infrastructures of societies are very, very difficult. For instance, if you come as a foreigner to a country, it's, it's uh, often very difficult to understand the logic of those. We have diversities in population in most societies and uh, several other such factors that cause transformations of uh, uh, societies. And these are some of the metaphors of our contemporary societies. Uh, I'm not going to defend these, but just to give you the flavor of uh, what people use. They talk about knowledge society, information society, media society, digital society, network societies, and, and uh, so on. And this signals that we are in a, in a mood of, uh, or in a stage of transformation into something new. And this has been going on since uh, after the Second World War, but it exploded during re recent uh, decades. Uh, and I limit myself here to digitization, but digitization is connected to all of these other issues. It's connected to globalization. Globalization and digitization go like this. They each presuppose each other. But uh, digitization is one of the most transformative powers of social life at present. Uh, it penetrates all kinds of activities, work, our working lives, our private lives, our 
the way we spend our time, the way young people spend uh, their time. And it's not just something for an elite. It's not just something that concerns the, the people who are uh, you know, living in a very educated or, or digitized environment. This hits all sectors of society. Uh, here you see a car repairman who is now working very differently from how they repaired cars 20 years ago. It's a completely different uh, profession. Uh, it has changed in this period. And here you see the traffic warden uh, in our city who also uses this uh, tool. So this is, this is a technology, but it's not like the, uh, the, the airplane or the train or, or the car, which are very specific, important and transformative technologies, but were rather sp specific. This is a broad change which affects all stages of our lives. So we have to ask ourselves, is this transformation, if you accept my description, uh, are these changes uh, significant? And if, if so, uh, what should we do about them as educators? Uh, or should we just decide that this is nothing for us? We let instruction go on as it, uh, as it has, we let, as it has been. We let the, um, the teachers and students live in a world which is not affected by this. And you have reactions in both, on both sides. For instance, President Macron a few months ago declared that they would ban mobile phones in schools, uh, which I think is a very interesting signal of, to young people who almost to 100% have mobile phones uh, and, and to tell them that everywhere out, but outside school, these are the things you use. That will be a very strange society eventually. Um, and I'm now going to say the rest of my talk is about very young uh, children because here we have seen dramatic changes over the past years. I show you the development in Sweden, which is a small and rather homogeneous uh, uh, country, but this is an, a development which is unprecedented. And to a large extent, it has taken place during the, part, the last 10 years. So it's not, it's not the internet generation, but this is the tablet generation or the smartphone generation that I'm showing you, and the iPad is about 10 years old, and children who come to school now have been raised with this tool in their homes, as I will show you. Um, we have a, just a few figures. It's very, I know it's very difficult to digest figures, but we have a, a, a foundation in Sweden which studies internet use, have been doing that for decades, and they have this benchmarking when 50% of the population uses a particular tool or uses the internet or uses a computer or whatever. And they use that for comparison. And I'll just quickly show you a comparison here. I hope you can read it. Uh, in 2000, that is 18 years ago, uh, this limit of 50% of users was 14 years. So the, the people who were older than 14 years used internet more and people who were younger than uh, in, uh, 14 years used in internet less than, than, uh, than 50%. In 2004, uh, this figure had changed, this, or this rate, this age was nine years, so it's sunk by five years in, uh, in five, it uh, sunk by, by uh, five years in, five, in four years. In 2011, this 50-year stage is three years old. And when I show you these figures, there are different statistics, but this, these are the figures when children are alone on the internet, when they are on their own operating the iPad or the smartphone, or whatever they're using. Uh, in 2014, there were over 50% of the two-year-olds, 75% of the three-year-olds, and well over 90% of the seven-year-olds were active on the internet on their own. In 2015, we had two-thirds of the two-year-olds were active, and 33, 32%, almost a third of all um, two to three year olds, of all two year olds were active on the internet every day, uh, week in and week out. And in 2017, these figures have grown, so it's now almost 80% of the two year olds who are active on the internet. And for three to, three to five year olds, the figure is 90%, and for six year olds, it's 98%. And it will soon be 100%. It never gets to 100%. It's very difficult to reach 100%. But we, are, we have completed this mission of putting information technology tablets into the hands of very, very young children. Uh, and here you see the same, uh, you see it as an image here, as a, as a, in, a, in a histogram, you see that this development in 2013 among the two-year-olds, you had 45%, and in, in 20, 
17, it was almost 80%. And when you come over on the right-hand side here, you see you all already have very high figures. Here the children are six, and here five, and here they are six, and you're almost up to 100% in 2017. And this is an amazing development, and I would argue that we have never seen a childhood change that quickly, because these are digital childhoods, uh, where people spend, young children spend a lot of time on the, with these activities. Uh, here you see the daily use, but it's basically the same figure. So um, the, point, uh, the point of what I'm saying is that the world is changing, and what are we as educators going to do about that? Uh, are we standing next and looking at this development, or do we take some measures to, to adapt to it? And uh, these tools are everywhere in the hands of children. This is not surprising, because there is a, there is a specific technological or series of developments which, has, which have led to this situation. It's not by random that two-year-olds, and in the next study, it, they will start with children of 18 months in the comparisons. It's not by random that this happens, because it, it depends on the fact that we have uh, mobile digital devices which we carry with us in our pockets, and they are very flexible. You don't have to go and sit at a table. Uh, we have connectivity, constant connectivity nowadays, and uh, we have the smartphone, and in particular the tablet. In the Swedish context, we used to have computers in preschools, but they were usually standing in the corner and not being used very much, except for children who needed some kind of extra activities. But with the tablet, the technology has brought into uh, the activity, into the interaction between teachers and uh, preschool teachers and pupils. It's uh, used for telling stories, playing music, and so on. And a very important feature of this, why children can operate this, is that we have a touch screen. So you don't have to write letters or numbers necessarily, but you have a touch screen when you navigate. And the latest addition to this uh, are the apps. We have millions of apps now. And many, many of these apps, a very high percentage, are geared towards children. Not necessarily small children, but, but uh, children in, in various forms. So this, this is the technological explanation why these uh, two-year-olds sit with these tools around them now. So how does this uh, development connect to Vygotskyan ideas? If we try to uh, see this in, in, in the Vygotskyan light, what will this mean for children's development? What will this mean for their cognitive, emotional, and so on uh, development? Uh, this, I think that is an, a very interesting question. You can see the learning trajectories here if you analyze this data from the foundation. Children begin at the age of two, or even before two, by watching TV, video clips, simple games, and they also use some educational apps which are in game form. Then as they grow older, they add activities which are more complex. They begin to send pictures first and then write texts or very short messages to their friends. They begin to enter chat for as they learn to write, which they do on the touch screen. And uh, they have the first contacts with social media. And uh, by the age of 10 or 11, this is going down every year, they are, most of them have a regular digital life. And this is, I think, very interesting, and we should keep that in mind. We shouldn't d discuss this issue as if, should we introduce uh, digital tools and tablets into preschools, because children already live digital lives. That is their life, a big part of their life. Measured in terms of hours, it's a lot of their time that they spend in these activities. Uh, so what are the consequences of this digitization uh, and for organizing a developmental and pedagogical interesting uh, approach to it? Because children do not necessarily learn anything by just having tablets in their hands. You have to have some sort of educational design, some sort of idea, some sort of curriculum. Well, I think one interesting point is that uh, besides what I said that we, uh, we already, all of us here already live digital lives. It's not something that is out there. It is part of us. We spend many hours on this. Uh, one obvious uh, consequence of this is that schools have lost control over many elements of, of uh, children's development and children's learning. Even if we do not introduce this in a systematic fact, uh, manner in schools and preschools, children have these tools at home, and they have an enormous power and attraction uh, for them. Uh, we, we, 
rely more and more to an uh, extent on, on external thinking tools in most of our activities, the way we remember, the way we ca calculate, the way we structure things, search for information and so on, we learn to rely on these uh, external tools. So that's another developmental path. So you can say that we are becoming cognitive hybrids. We do some things here, but we do a lot of things in collaboration with these uh, new artifacts. And we have new access points. We can enter uh, websites and enter, uh, recall information at uh, almost any time and anywhere on the bus or in the train or whatever. But of course, these, uh, these uh, resources, these, uh, these uh, tools, they rely on earlier forms of, of uh, symbol systems. So they, you actually have to know how to read and write. You have to develop a critical mind of understanding. You cannot skip that. The tool won't do that uh, uh, for you. Uh, it, you still have to develop those skills that we developed in print technology before. They belong to this picture. And by the way, we have never written so much as we do now with this new technology. We used to read a lot, but writing is much more frequent now in the general population. Another thing which I think is extremely interesting, we are... Uh, uh, children come to school these days, and I'm thinking of uh, when they come to primary school, uh, with established habits of how to engage with these tools. Uh, they engage with these symbolic technologies, with the tablets and so on, and they've done that for several years. So that's their home turf. That's where they um, uh, feel at home. And again, how are we going to react to this? I have a five-year-old grandson, and. Uh, I tried to tell him that uh, there was a time when there were no iPads, and he's just, he thinks I'm lying, because he's so much used to turning to the iPad, whatever he wants to know, whatever he wants to do, until his parents stop him. Uh, and uh, so the first point I've already made, we have to realize that we already live digital lives. It's not something that is marginal. It's a central part, if you look at how most people in this country and in Europe and other parts of the world spend the day, they interact with digital tools. They solve problems, they buy things, they do. Uh, and there's nothing that the educational system can do about this. We can't stop this. We can't pretend that this is not happening. We can't choose our society if in the educational situation. And the interesting question is, what will learning and development be in such a society? Not that we introduce the tools to learn better or to learn more, but what will learning and development be in such a society, in such a constellation of activities and resources? And um, how do we prepare children for citizenship in a, in a, in a digital uh, society uh, in, a, in a conscious and planned manner? How can we organize curricular activities so that the, these activities uh, generate knowledge and insight, generate skills and understandings. And uh, just a short note, note on this. So I think in some sense Vygotsky realized this, even though he had never heard of a tablet or a digital tool, I take it. Uh, because he, had, he made a very uh, famous speech where he talked about the instrumental method in psychology and the notion being that uh, that uh, we integrate these uh, external tools into our minds, into our activities, and that changes our minds. And the best example of this in print technology is remembering. When we remember, we use books, texts, and so on. We do not expect everything to be here. But when we want to remember, we turn outside and look at things and, and get them back. And I think these, this idea of instrumental acts as a guide for planning activities and for organizing activities are very uh, interesting if we connect them to the digital uh, development because we see that children grow up in a world where they learn to coordinate with these tools. They become very competent if these tools are available and much less competent if they are not uh, available. And they have, as I said, early exposure to such tools even if we do not introduce them in preschools, they are at home. Uh, and in the families. Um, and there, there are many potentials of this uh, to, uh, and, and I know that people usually emphasize the risks of technologies, like uh, we had that discussion when television was introduced in Sweden in the 1950s and 60s, and we had this uproar against children watching television all day and what would happen. But we have to, to consider that this, as I said, is nothing we can choose. This is happening, and we have to relate to it, and we have to design education in such a fashion 
that these experiences become uh, educational. And uh, I won't go into this, uh, but uh, this is of course an area of, of uh, where you can see, uh, use the concept of zonal proximal development in novel and innovative ways, both in interaction person to person. And by the way, I just a few weeks ago there was published a study on the, uh, the high users of internet in Sweden, teenagers, who we normally portray as highly individual and somewhat disturbed, but it was shown that they do not have less, con less physical contact with friends than the low users. So I think this tells us that this does not replace something. The digital technology is an addition to our repertoire of possibilities to, uh, to communicate. So to conclude, um, uh, what, is, what, is, uh, what can we learn from this? So where are we going? And of course, this is a very big thing because education is the biggest activity in society. So it takes a lot of time to implement matters. But, um, I think we should focus on supporting children in developing literacy, numeracy, and other skills of symbol manipulation because the, the age of initial learning of many of these skills move down from primary school to preschool. So preschool becomes much more important in uh, promoting literacy, numeracy, and similar skills. And, and uh, this is par partially due to the fact that children also engage with this at home when I use these tools. But the role of the preschool in, in uh, communicating and creating environments for learning these things will become much more important. And uh, I think what, when we do this, we should not borrow the tradition of the, uh, of the school of instructing children. We should try to integrate this within the concept of play, which is the origin of pre preschools. The preschools have a very different history than, than regular schooling. So we should maintain that, to have play as the leading activity, but to integrate these kinds of elements in, in, a, in a manner that is relevant from a curricular and adult uh, uh, perspective. And uh, to conclude, I think that this is, this is not just learning to use these tools, because we, that's one dimension of it, but it's increasingly important that children learn about uh, these tools about digital communication uh, in the sense they have to learn how to act and behave in virtual settings. Uh, they have to learn the consequences for other people of what they do when they write things or when they say, send messages. Digital contact is much more abstract. It's easier to, to uh, you know, communicate things that you later regret. I think all of us have done that. Uh, we must educate them about the dangers and challenges of these uh, situations. And we must develop a democratic and critical mindset which is relevant for a digital society and for a participatory democracy. We cannot pretend that this is not happening. The question we must ask ourselves, what are the relevant pedagogical practices that will carry children into the, into the future? Thank you very much. Спасибо, Роджер. Uh, thank you, Roger. I think uh, you made very valuable uh, insights and highlights on the digital resource and digitalization. On the other hand, you specified uh, the ethical points which emerge out of uh, the things and the new challenges uh, for personal development. Uh, do you have any questions to uh, Professor Celia? Uh, so, uh, it's not a question, it's just a comment. Uh, digital uh, learning, it's another thing people uh, try to scare us with. Uh, this is something uh, natural, this is natural transformation of education. At some point of time, oral training, when the, be, be, when the teacher was explaining, was replaced with uh, written uh, education with books, and then we remember when TV appeared and we thought uh, that the documentaries uh, will become the only way of teaching. And we survived through those times and the teachers did not disappear. Moreover, uh, preschool teachers 
And uh, it's the same challenge. Uh, we should not fear that. Everything is digital around us. What we can do? A school is digital. We should not uh, transform. We should be integrated. Our traditional values and uh, they are remain the same. I cannot hear without the microphone. Uh, the only thing which is the most valuable in life is human communication. Uh, let us uh, not allow our children to get rid of the best things that they can enjoy. Uh, but uh, uh, I think what the, the account you gave is very relevant because when, when um, popular literacy was introduced, people, many people reacted in the same way. Why should people learn to read? Why should girls learn to read? They will stay at home and, uh, and uh, mind for their children and the husband and so on. And, and I think we, we meet the, these new changes with our old values, our old perceptions, and then you create these, uh, these you see it as a threat. I also see it as, as a natural uh, development, but it's, there's still work to be done. I mean, this has to be done in a sensible way. It's not that the, this or that app or this or that digital tool is educational as such. It has to be integrated into a plan and into an idea. But that was the same with books as well. The book was not itself, uh, unless it was integrated in, a, in, a, uh, in, in some kind of planned curricular uh, activity, it didn't do anything. It was just lying there. And, uh, so, so, but I think, it's, uh, it's, uh, I think the preschool will be, when we look back in history, uh, we will find it natural that these activities of learning to read, uh, beginning to engage in virtual communities and so on, that was something we learned at, at preschool. <laughs> I think that, that's the way it's moving. And in Sweden we used to learn to read when we were seven and came to school. It's actually forbidden for preschools up until the 1960s to teach reading because it was argued that the brain was not mature enough, and so they would see this as a horror story, I guess, what I've shown you. But no, I completely agree, and, and uh, I also think that it's important that children who come to school recognize the tools that they're used to, and also to preschool, so. I didn't quite get what you said, but I hope I got the gist of what you said. <laughs> Professor Smirnova, <laughs> please. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your report. I think that was an exciting one. Is that is there an age before uh, which we do not recommend to use digital tools? Uh, for example, we do not recommend to use digital tools for children under this age. Uh, for example, when they have some, I don't know, abilities, we, uh, but when they don't have some abilities. It's very hard to combine physical activity, for example, uh, with digital tools because uh, children, they get uh, stuck uh, with the iPads. Maybe they read uh, real uh, books until which time, which age we should uh, prohibit that or just restrict somehow. Interesting question. I think it's, uh, we, must not, we must see, so what is the competition? What, what, if we look at how people, in this case young children, spend their day, what did they do before now that they're doing this? And in, in the study that I reported on this uh, Internet for Swedes, the, uh, you can see that what, what goes, this is teenagers, what goes down dramatically is television viewing, and what goes up is Internet use. And this apps, app, a balance in this, and in that perspective, uh, the internet use is much more active. It's not a one-to-many process where you just sit and listen. You interact and you do different things. So it's a more varied activity than, than uh, listening to television or, or listening to music in that sense. But of course, again, we must not, uh, you know, there, there will be problems, uh, there will be addicts of this kind. Uh, people that get totally hooked on this, and of course that's not healthy. 
Uh, but I, I think there are people who were hooked on television as well <laughs> previously. And we, we must not generalize because, for instance, if you look at multi, uh, on, uh, my, uh, online games and these massive online games, World, World of Warcraft and all of these, the average ages of, of the players of, of many of these are 30 to 35 years. I mean, it's, it's not something that just young people do. Older people do it as well. So, so we have to be nuanced. We have to look at the, what is happening empirically. And if a technology is powerful, like the car, it will also be dangerous. It will have some backsides. <laughs> if it would be totally innocent and only do good things, it wouldn't be valuable. And we have the same situation with uh, uh, these, um, these resources that, of course, some people can get addicted. But I don't think this is just young people. I think many adults suffer from that, too. Давайте последний вопрос, будем выбиваться совсем из графика, да, пожалуйста. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. In Russia, we also work on creation of mobile applications to uh, learn study Russian language. Do you have the same applications in Sweden or systems? How do you evaluate uh, this possibility? Will we have uh, more literate people uh, entering the school and uh, maybe usage of uh, these uh, technologies in the preschool? What's your opinion? Will this be effective? Um, well, we have a lot of these uh, activities. And there's also within the European Union has been a lot of projects with uh, designing... Uh, uh, tools where you can learn, uh, I think, the European languages. I'm not sure whether Russian is included, but English, French, German, uh, Spanish, and, and uh, so on. One is called Babel, which has been very, become very popular. It's very cheap and so on. Uh, so I, I think this is, again, this is a new avenue. This is something we can do. And people often do it in their spare time. And, and they may not develop a perfect vocabulary or perfect spoken language, but they make some, some uh, progress. Um, whether to, how to introduce this in uh, preschools. As I said, I never ask what is effective in preschools. I would never ask that question. Uh, I, it, this to me is an infringement of the freedom of the child to develop independently. But I, I, uh, I, I, and if you, as long as you keep the play as the leading activity, I think there are many very interesting ways of playing, for instance, with language, rhymes, songs, uh, all kinds of activities, counting in a foreign language. And uh, this is done in Swedish uh, preschools and home. You learn perhaps English in that way. You learn English n nursery rhymes and Christmas songs and uh, birthday songs and so on. And I think this is very nice. But I mean, in my opinion, we should not instruct children in uh, preschools. We should let them emerge into these activities, emerge into to these apps and tools and or, or, uh, act with them on their own with support from the teacher. But I wouldn't like a measurement of how much progress they make in the language and so on. It wouldn't tell me very much. If they are happy with it, if they work with it, if they're engaged, that's fine. Ну, Арфея Дорофеева, невозможно отказать, поэтому это совсем последний вопрос. So the last question. I think it's important that the parents is not uh, useful if we distract kids and uh, we need to uh, explain the kids uh, not to spend a lot of time with computers. I speak about uh, the majority of uh, today's young people. They do not uh, want to see TV programs. Uh, they do not drink. They do not smoke. Uh, if they know that it is harmful, they choose a different way of development. And I guess that we, if we explain this, and if we can simply do this, if the parents will uh, play with their kids, uh, read with them the books, uh, these 
uh, digital uh, technologies uh, will have uh, its own uh, way and its own uh, place and position the life of kids. And we should continue to uh, do uh, this. I guess this is very important. I'm not sure I got the gist of the question, but uh, a very frequent way of reading now in Sweden is reading from the iPad. <laughs> That's, uh, so these are hybrids, and it's very difficult to keep them apart. But I, I don't agree with what you say at all. I think it's the obligation of the school to prepare children for a preschool for a digital life. They will live in a digital society, and if you do not engage uh, with that as a curricular goal, I think schools would be failing uh, children because they are not going to live in any other life. Digitization is here and tomorrow is digital. And if schools say that this is nothing for us, then it's, uh, I disagree completely. Okay, we have to finish. Thank you very much, Roger.